Well, it is the top of the hour now at nine o'clock. Um, my name is James Spagle, everyone. I work for Cortev AgriScience. I've been on the MABA board for a little over a year now, and I'm going to be your moderator for this morning's sessions. Um, I've worked for both BSF and Corteva AgriScience in Montana for about a decade now. I'd like to thank you all for participating in the MABA Great Montana Ag Rally. This is a series of one hour educational workshops to help our membership continue to stay informed and up to speed on the latest technology information. I'd like to make a big shout out. Thank you to Corteva for their support of the rally and sponsoring this session. So now we're gonna get started on session one. We're gonna start off with a message from our sponsor Corteva. With that, everyone please enjoy this presentation. So today I'm really excited to talk to you guys about a new technology that we launched this past fall. So it's called Lumavia CPL. It is a completely new mode of action for cereal seed treatment. This is gonna be the Diamide Classic Chemistry or IRAC Group 28. So it actually acts on ryanidine receptors in the insect muscle fiber. Rapid feeding cessation leads to death. So this new technology controls and reduces the populations of wireworms, cutworms, armyworms, pea leaf weevil, and seed corn maggot. So very broad spectrum. It is systemic, both up and down. So it, it moves in the xylem and the phloem, has the ability to protect the roots, the seed coat, and new shoots as it is growing. Uh, this has been successfully used in Canada on cereals and thousands of acres, and also in the U.S. corn market. For those of you in Montana that grow Pioneer canola, you may be familiar with Lumiderm. This is a sister molecule to Lumiderm. So the package sizes are going to be two by two and a half in 30 gallon packs. The rate is going to be 0.5 to 0.75 fluid ounces per hundred weight. And that's going to vary, you know, based on pest pressure and what your seeding rates are. We do have great handling feedback. So everyone that got to use this this fall has reported that it handles incredibly well, no mixing issues at all, and it flows well under temperature constraints. We're really excited also because we have an upcoming pulse label registration for the 2022 growing season. So as I said, it is systemic upward and downward. This is just some radio tag photos on a corn seedling. And you can see that the majority of the product stays around that seed coat, but it does move up and down throughout the plant, providing systemic protection throughout the growing season. Now, what's the big difference between diamides and neonics? So it's one is the receptor they act on. The diamides act on the ryanodyne receptors and the insect muscle fibers. They have a longer residual, they have rap, rapid feeding cessation, and they do have a higher insect mortality rate. I mean, we're actually reducing populations, things like wireworms in the soil. The neonics are on the central nervous system, uh, system, but their feeding cessation is pretty slow. And you guys have seen that trying to battle wireworms with neonics for years. They have a very short residual. The molecules in a neonic are generally smaller and they will rush to the growing points. Hence their efficacy on pests like aphids, where you won't find that in the diamine chemistry. It is also a suppression label, meaning that insects are not necessarily killed and therefore the populations remain in the soil. You know, one of the exciting things from these products and what I remember when DuPont first launched the Renaxapir technology, the diamides, are one, the lower no impact on beneficials and the lower no impact on pollinators. And then also from a worker safety standpoint, there isn't a single signal word on the label, caution, warning, or danger. And so from a dust off and acute inhalation toxicity and worker safety standpoint, these are very safe chemistries to work with. So now to the data. So these were 12 trials, and then average across um, Washington, Idaho, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana. And you can see with your fungicide seed treatment only, we averaged 50 bushels. You got about 4.2 out of the cruiser, and then at the Lumavia, you know, at the low and the high rates, it was 6.9 all the way up to 10 bushel increase over the untreated or the fungicide only. So as we look under extreme wireworm pressure, and this is out of the Palouse, um, you can see that Lumavia, a little bit of Lumavia spiked in with the imidacloprid 
really outperforms any of the standards that they had previously, incredibly high rate of cruiser or a biological three-way from ABA. Pretty incredible data. Again, these are some excellent pictures. So this is Lumavia under extreme pressure against the fungicide seed treatment only. And as you can see, they still have to take a bite to feed to get the pesticide in them. And so there still is gonna be some feeding damage, but when you talk about what you guys are seeing in the field and what these new technologies can offer, it's awfully exciting. Again, this is under high wireworm pressure where the fungicide seed treatment only went 90.6. Our Lumavia at a half ounce plus varying rates of imidacloprid went between 127 and 140 bushels. This is really exciting stuff, guys. We're excited to bring it to the market. We're gonna see some real results out in the field. Again, you can see comparing it to the Neonix, it's gonna provide on its own a better, a better stand, healthier plants, and a higher control of those tough insect pests that you guys have been managing. Now this is exciting as well when we look at pulse crops in the future, but wheat as well. If you look without Lumavia, cutworms took almost 80 acres out in two days. Um, right next to it, Lumavia CPL saved replant time and money. And so when you talk about the spectrum of pests, you know, wireworms obviously concern, but there are another of other pests that we're also worried about in our cereals, fallow, and wheat rotations in Montana. And this one fits those pests as well, incredibly. So again, if you look, it's just, it's gonna be better than the neonics at wireworm, cutworm, armyworm, and then pea leaf weevil larva and seed corn maggot. Really the two holes that it has that neonix would fill in are gonna be aphid and hessian fly. So broad spectrum, new technology, environmentally safe. Um, that is what I had for Corteva. I am going to turn it over in a second to Tom Wolf with Agrometrics and Sprayers101.com. Tom Wolf is based in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan has 30 years of experience in the spraying business. He's got his bachelor's of science in 1987 and master's in science in plant science at the University of Manitoba and his PhD in agronomy from the Ohio State University. Tom focuses on practical advice that is research-based to improve the efficiency of producers. He also rides a unicycle to the office most days. Tom, take it away. All right. Uh, thank you so much, James. Uh, very exciting developments from Curteva. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, welcome everyone who joins us this morning uh, for the MABA webinar series. Um, I will be uh, speaking to you for the next 45 minutes or so about uh, spraying. We're going to talk about the th kind of things that might go wrong in what you might think is a, a good spray application. And we're going to focus primarily on the atomization side of things. We're going to talk about nozzles and pressure and, and those kinds of things, perhaps some pulse width modulation things. And we'll focus on that. So we will not talk about tank mixing or, or the kinds of antagonisms that can occur there. We'll simply talk about the the, the physical spray uh, application itself. So hope you enjoyed that. Um, after this one, um, there's going to be another one in a, uh, at uh, in about an hour and a half. So that that we'll we'll cover some other aspects that we might not have covered this time. So if you if you want to join us for that, you're certainly welcome to. And uh, with that, I think what I need to do is share my screen. So the question is. Uh, and I want to thank Luke uh, at uh, the the Scobie Co-op for uh, for that uh, that title uh, and the committee that thought of it. It's a good one. I applied ten gallons of water. Why didn't my herbicide work? So uh, we're gonna just try to get to the bottom of that a little bit. Um, of course, you know, using ten gallons of water is a, probably a pretty good first step. So, uh, but there's a lot of things that can actually still happen, and we're gonna try to just uh, quickly go go into some of those. When we atomize, uh, you know, we kind of just assume that the spray will travel properly from the nozzle down to the to the ground to the target, and ultimately will create some kind of a, a beneficial deposit like this one. And we can obviously visualize that with some water sensitive paper. And if I saw that in a field, I'd say there should be nothing wrong with that. 
Um, and you know, that's actually one of the things that is a, a nice, a nice uh, tool that you can actually have a very quick visual and see whether droplet size and so forth are, are in fact working. Um, but there's a little more to it than that. And, you know, I, I'm a Buckeye, I went to Ohio State, and, and we always like to show this little chart that shows that there's a little more, you know, between the nozzle and the biological effect, and that there's a lot of things that can actually affect that. You know, there's atmospheric conditions, uh, there's all kinds of uh, surface properties of the leaf, uh, you need the drying uh, can be affected by atmospheric conditions and so on. And there's lots of losses along the way. You know, we can lose things to drift, evaporation, the whole reflection and retention and spreading uh, dynamic is there. So, you know, it's not all uh, a, a done deal once you've atomized it. So a little bit, uh, a little bit of uh, consideration for some of the other factors is, is uh, appropriate. Um, the nozzle. I mean, the nozzle is really uh, the the most important tool on the sprayer. I mean, the sprayer is essentially a gantry for carrying some water and the nozzles with a pump to atomize or to pressurize the liquid. Uh, but we're focusing a lot more on other features of the sprayer. But this thing is still the, the bread and butter of it all. And the nozzle has three basic tasks. Uh, the first one is, of course, to meter the liquid. So that basically means if we want to apply 10 gallons per acre at 15 miles an hour, we probably need a flow rate of about 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 US gallons per minute per nozzle, something in that ballpark. The nozzle's job is to give you that exact metering flow rate across the entire width of the boom. Secondly, because even though you might think 10 gallons is a lot of water for Montana standards, uh, it's actually not a lot when you look at the big scheme of things. And in order for it to, to work properly, we do have to spread that out quite uh, properly. So we, we atomize it into droplets that are just the right size, you know, the Goldilocks droplet size, not too fine that it drifts away, not too coarse that, that we don't have coverage. And that middle ground has been so elusive. And I think... Uh, uh, that's a, a really big part of what uh, what we have to try to achieve. And of course, the distribution. So it has to be uniform. Um, so it's, it's a really, um, it's a bit of a, there's not a lot of tolerance for error here. Uh, and I think we, we ought to, you know, give a tip of the hat to our nozzle manufacturers that have done a pretty fantastic job of delivering excellent products for us. The number one error that I encounter in the field is the perhaps the most basic thing. It, it seems basic at first look, but it's the wrong uh, spray pressure. And there's a lot of different reasons that this could be the case. Uh, before we go there, let's let's talk about this this whole uh, language of of droplet size. We're talking about uh, sort of what we call spray quality. And the American Society of Ag and Biological Engineers has developed a standard called S572.1. We're actually on S572.3 now. Uh, they're similar, but they basically uh, categorize sprays into these uh, different qualitative categories. And we're, we're more or less now saying, look, you should spray with a medium spray or a coarse or a very coarse spray. And we're no longer uh, so much quoting the the volume median diameter, even though we have identified it as a reference here. And the reason they've done that is because the the volume median diameter, this number in the right column, it you know the numbers depend on how you measure them. Some people use a certain kind of laser. Some people have other tools, and it, depending on the tool you use, the numbers can vary quite a bit. So you can't really hang your hat on any of these numbers. However, the standard developed by the ASABE uh, kind of brings all this together and says, look, uh, from any nozzle, if it says it's medium, it doesn't matter whether that nozzle is made in the US or in the UK or in Germany, a medium spray is gonna be about the same for any any nozzle. So it's a, it's a, it's a unifying standard. So if a label, uh, for example, says, please apply this in a medium spray or a coarse spray. Uh, it, it shouldn't matter what nozzle you use or what the VMD of that nozzle is published as, if you can even find that. If the ASABE standardized size is medium and coarse, you should be good to go. 
All right. Why is pressure so important? Well, it's because in the last 20 years in my career, we've had a whole game, a, a complete wholesale change of the way we, uh, the nozzles we use and the atomization we use. And we still are a little bit stuck on the, in the past. It's a habit. Uh, it's, a, it's a tradition. Here's a flat fan nozzle. It's running at 15 PSI. It's actually delivering a medium spray quality. And we're increasing our spray to about the 40 PSI range here. At this pressure, it's already a fine spray, believe it or not. Uh, but for, So 40 PSI is pretty well as high as we want to go. Uh, any higher than that, it just gets finer and finer. It might even get, you know, it doesn't ever get very fine, but at 90 PSI here, it's, you can tell visually it's so fine. It's probably not going to stay on target. It's going to drift away and create all kinds of problems. So we go to a low drift nozzle. This is an air induction tip. It's also a T-Jet. This is a T-Jet AI, one of the first air induction tips. You can see it uh, running here at low pressures. It's barely atomizing. Uh, it's ultra coarse and extremely coarse at pressures that we thought were normal. Uh, so this is this is 40 psi, a, a regular pressure we would think, but it's actually much too coarse. We actually have to run this nozzle at 60 to 70 psi to get to that very coarse category, and we can't even really get out of that category with this nozzle. So even even uh, extremely high pressures uh, are still low drift with this kind of nozzle design, and in fact because our fluctuation in travel speed will also fluctuate the, the nozzle pressure, we actually have to operate this nozzle at a higher overall pressure. So we have a little bit of room to move and we're gonna, we're gonna get to that. Um, we first woke up to the whole pressure th situation uh, some years ago, we were spraying some Liberty, uh, which is a popular herbicide in canola, as you know, uh, and, and you, uh, you don't grow a lot of beans in, in Montana, but uh, can be used there as well on, on, on some of those triple stack traits, traded beans now. Um, anyway, we, we noticed when we looked at uh, the oat biomass, so a lower number is better. And we looked at three different nozzles, uh, the finest of the nozzles, an intermediate nozzle and a very coarse nozzle. And we compared it. We compared the performance to this dashed line here, which is the flat fan that I showed you before, about a medium or even a fine spray at 40 psi. And we saw that when we increased the spray pressure, we were able to achieve pretty well the same or almost the same uh, performance with these low drift nozzles as we had with the flat fan nozzles, although at much less drift. So th even though these pressures are high, the spray, pr the, the the droplet size is still relatively coarse, and that was true for the early staging and the late staging as well. And um, in some cases, you know, perhaps in this in this extremely coarse nozzle here, uh, we could have gone a little higher in pressure, and that would have probably brought that uh, performance back into into line. So that was the really the first lesson. And the you know the mistakes we were making is that we we actually ended up using the wrong nozzle size when we moved over to the air induction tips. We perhaps didn't downsize enough. So let's just go through a short little couple of exercises and 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 uh, bring this point home. Assume you're using a 11004, a red nozzle. It's a Venturi nozzle, so it's an air induction tip. It's a, it's a low drift tip, and you want to do 10 gallons breaker. What travel speed should you use with this tip? Well, we want you to go to the nozzle charts, and they're available in any of these catalogs. Uh, John Deere, T-Jet, I've, I've just got the John Deere example here, but they all use the same basic charts. And if you uh, look at some of the columns in these charts for the red nozzle, you'll see that uh, you have pressure and speed. And uh, I'm suggesting for this particular nozzle, it's an air induction tip that you should uh, choose a, uh, a 70 PSI pressure that, and you can achieve that at 16 miles per hour. So the rate controller kind of does that for you. And that's, that's very good. Uh, but it basically means, wow, you're really motoring here with this, with this nozzle. Let's say for a second that you've got a different nozzle on. Let's say you've got the 11005 nozzle on. It's a brown nozzle. You're still doing 10 gallons per acre and you want to do 16 miles per hour. What is the pressure going to be? I mean, maybe that's what you're dialed into. That's, that's your instruction. Do 10 gallons, go 16. Well, if you look at this nozzle chart again, you'll see that at 16 miles per hour, this larger nozzle actually only operates at 44 psi, and that might be too low. And you know, even though we're, we've actually asked the rate controller to take care of this part of it for us and say, "Look, I want 10 gallons per acre. Make sure that happens at whatever travel speed I travel," you still have to keep your eye on the pressure because maybe 
it's delivering that output at too low a pressure. In this case, I would suggest it's too low. And you should really go back to that, uh, that 04 and go a little higher. And that's because of the spray quality. So here's the spray quality chart for, the, uh, for these nozzles. Uh, you want to be sort of in the middle of the course categories that if you do need to slow down for rough ground or, or so uh, or turning or whatever hills uh, that you have a little bit of room to move you can slow down your pressure will drop to maybe 40 but you're still somewhere in the acceptable part of that pressure uh, that droplet size if you uh, were to use the 05 nozzle I'm just assuming the same spray quality although it's a little coarser you are very close to the bottom end of that pressure range at, below which your spray quality goes so coarse that you might not get the coverage that you're you're looking for so you know just keep an eye on the on the pressure gauge um Sizing the nozzle, just a, a very quick review of how that happened. It's kind of a fun exercise. It's the thing I do almost every day, uh, but it depends on three variables. All sizing of nozzle really asks, you have to have, have answers to three questions. The first one is, what is the nozzle spacing on my sprayer? Boom. It's usually 20 inches, but we see a lot of 15 inches from row crops. So just make sure that you've got that clear. There's different charts for different spacings. You got to know your volume, 10 gallons, five gallons, and your speed that you, you know, honestly want to try to travel at based on your workload. Uh, the, the catalogs all have these charts. They look like this. They're in the, in the back pages. Some of them have them for each of the nozzles that they use. And basically what you're looking at is here's the nozzle size. Here's the spray pressure. Here's, uh, you know, the, the grade area. Here is the, the, the pressure at which that nozzle produces its nominal flow rate. So it basically doesn't mean that's the pressure you should use it at. It just means, hey, the O5 nozzle, the brown nozzle, at 40 PSI delivers 0 0.5 US gallons per minute. So that's actually the reason it's an O5 nozzle. That's the standard. And um, that's really just a reminder. Okay, let's go to the 16 mile per hour question. What we're doing here is we're looking for 16 miles per hour in the top row here. And now these numbers in this, in this column are actually gallons per acre. So we are looking for 10 gallons per acre. So let's find it. Uh, we're gonna find it perhaps here, the O3 nozzle, the blue nozzle at a very high pressure, just about gets there, probably not a good solution. The 035 nozzle, a more common size for some nozzles, does it at about 100 psi, eh, pretty high pressure. The, the 04 nozzle, though, does it at about 70. So we identified that pressure before in our earlier exercise. So that's a solution if it's an air induction tip. The 05 nozzle does it at about, you know, between four, like around 50 psi or so. And perhaps there's another solution that we've got for the 06 nozzle, which does it at about 30 PSI. So those, uh, those are the solutions. Uh, they come at the intersection point of the red horizontal row and the blue column, and that's that. So you're looking for gallons per acre. And you know, ultimately, you, you're probably going to choose one that matches the spray pressure that your nozzle should run at <clears throat> to give you the droplet size and to be sort of in the middle of the pressure range for that tip. So now I've never liked the setup of these charts and sometimes you find a different layout. And that is the reason I don't like them is because most of the time we've you know, committed to a gallon and about our travel speeds may be up in the air. So we can actually switch these numbers around. It's very handy. So we can pretend that this mile per hour row here is actually gallons per acre. And then all of these numbers that were gallons per acre become miles per hour. Let's see how that works. Let's just uh, go down this column, 10 gallons per acre, and we find that the intersection of these uh, rows is exactly at the speed that we're trying to solve for. You can see the 16 or 15 mile per hour solution comes up every single time. So why is that handy? Well, it's handy because now that chart gives you different information. If we choose 10 gallons per acre and the 04 nozzle, and we decide that we can run it at 15 to 115 PSI, assuming it's the, a nozzle can do that, this now becomes our travel speed range. So we can go between 7 and 20 miles per hour. We're aiming for the middle of that range, about 15 or so. So we have a little bit of room to move, as I said, with a rate controller. So what we've done on Spurs 101, uh, our website, it's a free website for you to use. You can download a, a chart that's like this. And we basically have, uh, you know, already arranged things for gallons per acre. 
and then we're using the 04 nozzle. We've modified the spray pressure a little bit and we've put a gray out area here at a pressure that we think is the right one for high, uh, high pressure air induction tips. So we're saying 30 to 100 and there's your travel speed range. So, you know, that's a, a planning tool. That's how you use these charts. So uh, very, very handy. Now let's introduce a label that says for drift protection, we want to go coarse, and that's the legal requirement. And let's say that you've got the Guardian Air, it's a high pro nozzle, a Guardian Air 11003, and you want to still do your 10 gallons breaker. What are the travel speeds that are actually possible with this nozzle? And you do have to go to the manufacturer's charts here, find out what is the spray quality this nozzle produces. And if, it, if you're looking for course, you're really only able to uh, run it at about 50 to 60 PSI. That for, for that size nozzle, that's 10 to 11 miles per hour. Any faster, you'll push the, the pressure higher and you'll go and drift more. So, you know, this basically means you should get a larger nozzle if you're not satisfied with a 10 mile per hour travel speed. So those are the kinds of things that uh, we want to get through. Remember the the, you know, sometimes people say, they ask me how fast should I drive? And the answer that I usually give sort of jokingly is, you should drive 60 PSI. So, you know, your pressure gauge is actually your speedometer. And if you drive 60 PSI because that's the optimum for that nozzle and you don't like the actual speed you're going, it's too fast or too slow, that tells you that you've got the wrong size nozzle in there. And that's kind of how I like to run it. This is an, uh, a New Holland sprayer. Just took a picture of it from outside one day because, well, they've got, they had a front mount boom and they had the pressure gauge right in the field of view of the operator. It's an analog gauge. You don't have to look at your monitor. It's always where you're looking. You know the pressure you're running. It's very, very cool. All right. Let's talk about spray quality and water volume. So that's another uh, little variable we want to look at. Uh, now, I've introduced this thing called spray quality. So fine, medium, coarse, very coarse. I want to unpack that a little bit and just talk about uh, the actual distribution of the droplet sizes in various nozzles. So these are Wilger nozzles. They're very common on case sprayers with aim command. What I've done here is put the droplet diameter in the bottom and the volume here. The volume is just a, a unit. It could be microliters, could be whatever. Um, and this is a kind of a distribution we get. So this is the ER11006. So that's an extended range nozzle. It's a conventional flat fan. I'm running it at 40 PSI. And you can see uh, the volume is distributed uh, mostly on the left side and a little bit on the right. And we want to then superimpose on that a lower drift version of that same nozzle. This is the Wilger SR, has a pre-orifice. And what it's doing, and what all low drift nozzles are doing, is it's, it's introducing a pre-orifice that actually lowers the operating pressure of that tip. And so you're really just, you know, you're still reading 40 PSI, but you actually have reduced the internal pressure. Now let's look at what it does for drift. So these, this yellow area here on the left side is the driftable size fraction, basically. Anything less than about, about 150 microns. And you can see we've reduced drift by a factor of at least 50%, maybe more. And uh, we also want to keep an eye on the right side, which is the the size fraction that's over 600. And that's the size fraction that we think might be wasted because it doesn't produce a lot of drops. And it's so big that maybe they'll bounce uh, and, and, and not do anything. All right, let's go to the SR. And now let's go to the Wilger MR11006. So this is, again, a slightly coarser version of that same nozzle design, a different pre-orifice, exit orifice ratio. And look at, we've shifted the, the distribution to the right. Again, superior reduction in drift. We've actually halved drift again, but now we're starting to put bigger droplets into that right size here, right side, and that is where we're going to have loss of coverage. Let's do one more step. Let's go to the DR. So this is the MR, same one I showed you before. This is their second coarsest category. This is the DR. Almost no drift, but look at the proportion of the total volume, maybe a third of it. Uh, that is actually in the very large droplets. Are these droplets doing anything? Is that dosage useful for you? Are you getting runoff? That's definitely a concern, and it depends on the kind of target that you have. So, you know, grassy versus broadleaf target. So these are the things to consider. That's kind of the, the numbers behind this, this uh, droplet size uh, distribution uh, or spray quality. Let's look at some herbicides. 
Now, uh, Horizon, I hope it has the same name in Montana as it does up here in Saskatoon, but this is Clodinophob. So this is a, a group one grass killer. It's great. It's an older product, uh, but uh, we applied it uh, using three spray qualities, medium, coarse, and very coarse at four gallons. And you can see that the oat control we achieved was reduced at the four gallons when we went to very coarse. We got good performance though at, uh, at coarse and medium spray qualities. When we went to eight gallons and 12 gallons, we recovered that loss of performance, no problem. And that's because um, we had more droplets to play with. So that was very powerful. All right, look at Puma Super, another group one, another grass killer. Uh, again, it's a bit of an older chemistry, but it, the principle is the same. Now it performs a little different, a little bit more dramatic fall off at the very coarse spray quality. We didn't quite get it back. Uh, and so the, the very coarse spray quality is kind of a no-go zone for, for that particular uh, product. So it's almost product by product. Um, here's what it looked like. Here's the untreated. Uh, the medium spray, no, this is without crop competition. So this is probably the industry standard. There was a few later mergers maybe and some, some escapes because of no wheat growing there. But uh, when we went to the coarser sprays, we really had a wreck. So again, a competitive crop will help in each of those situations. Assure 2, so again, uh, still a, a popular part in oil seeds. Look at how sensitive it is. At four gallons, even the coarse spray didn't really work, and it's hard to recover from that. So we really kind of drew the line in the sand and said, hey, uh, for these group ones, don't go coarser than coarse, and don't go lower in water volume than eight, ga uh, than eight gallons, even four gallons. You know, sometimes you might be able to go to four, but it's a product specific situation. So uh, be very mindful of that. I've already talked about water sensitive paper. Uh, it is a powerful tool, but we just want to maybe reiterate that if you can get some co-op should be able to get it in. Um, it's made by T, well, it's made by Syngenta. It's a, it's a T-Jet product, uh, T-Jet sells it though. So does Hypro, so, does, so do most uh, manuf uh, nozzle manufacturers. It's the same stuff, throw it on the ground, spray over it and have a look. Where are you? If you're down in the bottom right-hand corner, sort of extra coarse, four gallons per acre territory, don't go there. If you're, you know, if you want more coverage, you know, there's a, you know, you can go finer if the weather's good and the label allows it, or you can go more water if you just need to get the job done and stay coarse. So those are the kinds of decisions that uh, this water sensitive paper helps. I've drawn a line in the sand here. It's a little bit of a decision that everyone uh, makes based on the chemistry and their comfort zone, but it doesn't take long and you get more and more familiar with it. In the next talk, if you can stick around for it, I'll go into a little more detail about analysis of water sensitive paper, the kind of tools that are available. Uh, again, TJET publishes these charts. They all do, all the manufacturers do. The TJET ones are the prettiest, to be honest, you know, because they're all they're all in one place. So here's the AIXR TJET. Uh, you know, if you were going to use the AIXR 11003 and you want to go to a coarse spray quality, you could see that you'd have to go at least 50 psi. Um, if you use the Turbo T-Jet, an excellent tip, uh, good for PWM, but a little finer. Uh, so if you want to go to a coarse category here, you'd have to stay between 25 and 40 PSI. Okay. If you went to the uh, T-Jet AI, a superior low drift tip gets you out of tough spots, uh, you know, to go to a coarse spray quality to get the coverage, you'd have to go to 90 PSI. So, you know, uh, there's little surprise that, that the, the Turbo T still has longevity, but nozzles like the AIXR, a low pressure air induction tip, really has hit the sweet spot, does basically, does it all. Hypro has one, Williger has one, Leckler, uh, Air Bubble Jet, you know, they all kind of make these, these categories. As, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the spray, uh, the rate controller, and it's powerful, it's useful, I, I love them, but, they can lull you into a false sense of security because they take care of business for you. You've dialed in 10 gallons an, an acre and you're going. But as you speed up and the pressure rises, your spray quality starts off quite coarse and gets finer and finer. And so these weeds, this buckwheat and this oat plant, for example, here, um, you know, you might not get the oat at the low travel speed at the low pressure, and uh, you might drift too much at the high pressure and high travel speed. That's really the whole point I'm trying to make. 
another thing to remember here is that the the grassy weeds really don't retain as much spray. They're vertical, they're difficult to wet. Um, you know, their overall spray retention per gram of, of weed mass is much lower. They just have a, a lot of things against them. So we do have to be very mindful. If if the, the, there's a grassy weed in your spectrum, and it probably is, and you're tank mixing, and you probably are, uh, you know, you have to, th that becomes your limiting factor. You can't really go to a super low drift spray because you're not going to get the oat control. You're, you're, it's, it's, a, it's a target that just needs a slightly finer spray. So that's kind of a fact. Be mindful. Here's the teacher at AIXR again. I just showed you this, but be mindful of some other nozzles. This is another great T-Jet nozzle, probably their best seller, and it's because of dicamba. And so everyone's you're putting a turbo T-Jet induction on there. Uh, great tip, great for low drift, uh, ultra coarse, really, but not really a grassy herbicide nozzle, not really a, a nozzle for maybe your, you know, your early season burn-off when your weeds are tiny. Uh, when maybe you got grasses in the one or two leaf stage and it don't hardly present a you know a, 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 a pinky fingernail size target, just not the right nozzle. It's a good nozzle for higher water volume. Uh, it's a good nozzle for later season when you reach a little bigger. It's certainly a good nozzle. It's essential also for dicamba and 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 other products that are drift prone. So uh, just be mindful. All right, let's talk a little bit about boom height. Uh, this is a bit of a bee in my bonnet. Uh, our booms are higher than they ever were, and that's because we're going faster. In drift work, where we try to recover the spray and uh, and we use Petri plates and other collectors underneath the swath, when we put Petri plates, which are supposed to collect everything that you spray directly under the boom, uh, even for a low speed, uh, low boom situation on the left side, we're only recovering about 80% of the spray. Now we can increase our recovery by going to a coarser nozzle, as you might expect. But once we use even those same spray qualities uh, with a high boom, we can never quite get more back. We're actually losing quite a bit more. So that's, just, that's actually a significant loss of dose. Uh, very uh, important. So, uh, you know, the, the challenge really is, what can we do about boom height? Can we go low enough? What do we need to do? And um, of course, uh, the drift data are in favor of low booms. Uh, here's a pull type sprayer. We did this uh, drift work quite a while ago now, but we had a 20 inch boom height, eight mile per hour travel speed, sort of what I grew up with as a kid on the farm. Uh, a, a medium spray quality here. Uh, TJ XR, and here's the air induction tip, and this is airborne drift here on the left side. Here's wind speed, that's in kilometers, but the 20 is 12 miles an hour, okay? So right here, we're seeing about a four-fold reduction in drift just by going to the, the, the coarser spray, so, so totally powerful. My point, though, is when we go to the high clearance sprayer, we're using a turbo T-Jet, same drift curve, it's actually a coarser spray, but it still has the same amount of drift as the much finer spray had for the low boom. Uh, and that's because of the boom height and the travel speed. When we put the coarsest tip we could find on there, the AI-11004, we only had a two-fold reduction in drift. We never got back to that, that drift uh, level that we had with a low boom, slow speed sprayer, even though the spray qualities were the same. And that is essentially because this fast travel speed, high boom sort of revolution uh, has increased drift once more. And we're asking the nozzles uh, to, to pick up the slack. And I guess the lesson here is that the nozzles can't pick it all up. Uh, at some point, if you want to reduce drift even further from this level here on the red line, you're going to have to go slower and lower that boom again. Um, so sometimes, you know, I, I usually stop and take pictures of people when I see them spray at a zoom lens that day. This is just about an hour and a half drive from Saskatoon. I thought he was doing a great job. You know, even that though, that's probably 25, 30 inches. It, it doesn't look like it. Uh, it looks very low from the field, from the edge of the field, but that's not, not a very low boom height. The challenge really is to get the boom uniform. You know, this is another shot I took driving a few years back. And I wanted a sort of the magazine cover shot. And I was looking for 
the level boom wide. And I had to take a lot of pictures to get that because his boom was all over the place. And if you look here, you know, he might not have a, might not have had auto boom or had it off or something. And it was a little bit of a rough field, but that's probably 40 or more inches. That's probably 50 inches above, above ground. It doesn't look that bad from the distance, but that's a high boom. And uh, the drift potential is just, just there. The other thing is, is uniformity. You know, even here, this is a fungicide trial we did a few years back. And even though he knew I was taking this picture and, you know, he was doing a good job, very conscientious uh, fella, that boom was 40 to 50 inches above the, above the canopy here. And that's just because, you know, he was swaying a little and he just, his auto boom just wasn't good enough. So we looked at a few things, you know, what happens if you go too low or too high? And I think we all kind of know what it is, but we, we put some samplers out into a field. Uh, we drove uh, over this site at different travel speeds and different boom heights, and we collected the spray on these straws, and we used a dye. And then we, we sort of analyzed, here's the dye on the straw. And then we said, all right, uh, we had sort of the, on my right side, here's the tractor, we're driving into the screen, here's the left outer boom. Um, we just kind of looked at all the different collectors that we had on different uh, parts of the boom. And this is kind of the uniformity we achieved. So this is 14 miles per hour. We had a fairly high boom, but even then we still had that boom sway. And so what happened is as, the, as we kept doing it over and over again, you know, sometimes the boom would dip low. And in some cases it actually knocked the collectors right off the field. And, you know, this is just skimming the top. So, you know, we're, we're at a spot here where we're right between the nozzles. There's essentially nothing there. We're hitting that gap. Here we're directly under a nozzle and we're getting all the spray. So that's striping, you know, you're not really getting the spray where you want it to go. It's visual, obviously you can see it uh, when, when it's all said and done. But just by going uh, a little slower, I mean, it's quite a bit slower, but we basically still didn't have perfect distribution but we didn't really have that same problem. We still had sway. I still wasn't that happy, but uh, we solved some of that problem just by slowing down. And, you know, if you've, if you've ever looked at sprayers101.com, we talk about slowing down areas as well. I got to get done. I, you know, I got a tight window. I got to get the work done. What are you going to do? And the answer is, efficiencies, the, the, the acres per hour aren't really found by driving faster. They're found by being more efficient with your downtime. On a good spray day, having a great tender system, uh, having a fast fill, uh, being very efficient with your cleaning and being sure that it's clean without spending two hours getting there, uh, stringing a whole bunch of fields together with the same tank mix so you don't have to clean. Those are all uh, terrific efficiency factors. I even had a guy uh, that, whose farm I visited who told me he bought some oil tanks from the oil fields, uh, made them clean, you know, that they didn't have oil in them, they had some kind of brine in them, so they were water cleanable. And he puts them in the corners of his fields that are remote, he, he keeps them full of water. And they're black, obviously they're solid, they're not plastic tanks. And then he doesn't have a long way to go for his tender truck. So that I thought was very cool. All right. Let's keep going here. The dense canopy. Uh, this is a common one. We, we you know, we we really have to measure the spray at the target height. So these are some peas we sprayed. Uh, we did a, a project with with Case uh, CNH, uh, looking at some experimental sprayers, and we we measured the amount of spray that reached the top of the canopy, the middle and the bottom of the canopy. Here's five gallons per acre. Looks not bad. Here's ten. Here's fifteen. So big drops too, by the way. So then we went um, a, little, uh, a little further down. This is the middle of the canopy. Five gallons per acre, not so good anymore. Even 10 isn't that great. We really had to have the 15 to get decent density of droplets. Uh, let's go to the lower canopy. Almost nothing there with the five gallons. So the canopy's caught it all. Uh, here's your 10 gallons. And here's your 15 gallons. Not mm, hugely better, but you know, probably good enough to to get the coverage that you need for either the disease or the insect, or in this you know, in this case, the herbicide. I drew a line in the sand here. The Syngenta on their water sensitive paper says 80 drops per square inch is what you should aim for for good coverage. 
And so we uh, we counted the drops and we saw we got 107 with the five gallons, top, middle, and bottom. We got 30 and 20. Uh, when we went to 10 gallons, uh, overshot the mark here, but uh, didn't quite get there here. We did have to go to the 15 gallons to get where we needed to be almost. And even there, the, the canopy wasn't maybe uh, open enough. So that's a that's a deal. That's a, a, a big deal. Measure the, the, the deposit at the target height that you're trying to achieve. And um, water is your tool. Water is what gets the spray to the bottom of a canopy. It's not droplet size. It's not spray pressure. Uh, water volume, lower, slower travel speeds. Let's talk about speed a little bit. Uh, you know, it, it is, I guess, a, a pretty popular thing to uh, to go fast. So this is a, a drone. I borrowed this uh, drone footage from someone uh, for whom we sprayed, and he, they just collected the drone. Uh, he he phoned me. The operator phoned me during this time and said, "I'm driving 25 miles an hour." And he did this to bug me, but uh, he had a section. This was Durham. Uh, he had a section to cover. It was Fusarium, and he needed to get it done. But you know, I got a couple of pictures here of him basically having a spray plume that's more or less, you know, hundreds of feet long. That spray cloud can go anywhere. You have no control over it. And a lot of it is really just the, the speed that he went. Uh, when I analyzed these images later, I, it was a few days after I called him and I said, I think you've got some plugged nozzles, by the way. So <laughs> uh, that is another thing that, uh, you know, sometimes we just assume we got a big, he had O8s in there. He had a capstan pinpoint, he had O8s, and I never would have thought they were plugged, but the screens were plugged. I went back, we looked at them, and sure enough. Um, so that's uh, when you're in a big rush, you might not take the time uh, to do that. Uh, uniformity overall, you know, this leads us to really the uniformity question. Why is it that uniformity is such a big deal? You know, uh, the manufacturers do test their nozzles uh, and they, they do a patternation test and they, they tell us how, how it looks. And it, they do a great job of that. Almost every nozzle that's sold these days has undergone a flow test for qual and, and a, a visual assessment. They actually physically will put every nozzle that they make into a in a spray booth, someone, someone with an apron sitting there and they're looking at the flow rate, making sure it's good. And they're looking at the pattern, making sure it's good. And if it's good, it goes into an accept. And if it's bad, it goes into the reject bin and it gets chucked. So there's a great deal of quality control. But in, in what we learned from the aerial business is that patterns aren't as good as we thought they were. And this is actually a very good aerial pattern. Um, this is an actual string data from a fly-in um, and it's, I would say high fives. Um, but even when, when the wind comes from the side in the aircraft, this was a headwind before, we're pushing the spray into a high pressure system. It kind of can't escape and we get some of some of these kinds of things. This is something that's sometimes covered with you know overlap property and so on, but this kind of variability is not that uncommon. So what's the big deal? Um, the big deal is, if we go back to this one, um, this is a square meter. Uh, we put 64 samplers into the square meter, and we just wanted to do a micro analysis of, you know, how how bad is it? And this is what it looks like. You know, we're seeing a medium and fine sprays in a bare soil or in a in a stubble situation, maybe a precede burn off into a cereal stubble, and we're seeing even shading of the stubble. So these kinds of deposit reductions are not unusual. What does that mean? What, what, what does it mean? If we take one of these deposits and we say, all right, the average deposit is 100% of what we intended, and that's the dashed line here, but the actual deposit we found in the field in one of these graphs I just showed you actually is sometimes higher, sometimes lower, sometimes higher. It's all over the place, but the average is the same. So what's the big deal? What's the problem with having a variable spray deposit? And here is, here is the problem. Most, well, almost all herbicides, uh, many fungicides and insecticides for that matter too, but certainly herbicides, have what we call a logistic-shaped dose response. That means that if you look at weed biomass, 
So a hundred percent is no control whatsoever. And we increase the herbicide rate, we get this kind of an S-shaped curve. And if we say we're to assume that we wanted this level of weed control, I don't know why you wouldn't want more, but let's just say we want 20% or 80% control, 80% reduction in weed biomass. This is the rate that would achieve that. Now, let's assume that we would put in this variable deposit. Okay, same average rate. Is it the same weed control? The actual answer is it's not. The actual level of weed control is more like 30% or a 70% reduction in in weed uh, uh, growth. And the reason is this. When we take this average dose and we overdose, such as in this peak here, we gain a little bit of control, a little bit. It's a flat part of the curve. But if we underdose, we lose a lot more than that because that's in a, a, a steeper part of the curve. And that's the nature of this inflection point. The benefit of overdosing isn't nearly as big as the penalty for underdosing. And then when you look at the dose response and the actual weed biomass, you get this, uh, this reduction of control. And that's possibly why many of our labels kind of uh, allow us to overapply. They're trying to account for variations in weather, application accuracy, and so on. And here, this variation doesn't matter. But if, if for any reason, for example, poor weather conditions, poor growing conditions, been a cool spring, you're spraying late, um, it's windy, maybe you're spraying a coarser spray, maybe you have a hard, hard to control weed, you're pushing, even though you're not changing the label rate, you're essentially pushing the dose response curve toward that flat part and this whole variability thing becomes an issue. So when everything's hunky-dory, uh, variability it gets sucked up by the excess rate, but when it's not, then you do have to be mindful of it. Okay, let's finish off with uh, some talk about pulse width modulation. Uh, a growing technology. Uh, we see it all over the place. You know, John Deere came in a few years ago with uh, 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 Exact Apply. A Capstan kind of invented the whole thing out of Topeka, Kansas. They're still a big player in the game. Raven uh, entered the market about four or five years ago uh, with their Hawkeye and kind of did a lot of OEM installs because they they have a full line of equipment. We're seeing other ones. This is Weed It. Weeded had now has a weeded quadro. It's a weed sensing spray. We'll talk about that in in uh, 45 minutes when we uh, do the next or the, the next session, I guess. Um, uh, and it it does have um, a full blown pulse with modulation system. Of course, the idea is that uh, for PWM, we can try. We have a much higher travel speed range. It basically, for a conventional system here, we're running between 30 and 90 psi for your average nozzle. The travel speed ratio, the flow rate ratio, is only about 1.7, and that's the square root of, of of the threefold factor that we've got in pressure. That means a travel speed range of about 10 to 17 miles per hour. It's not big enough for a lot of guys. Look, if you've got a PWM system, you've got a duty cycle range of somewhere between 20 and 100%. That gives you a, a five-fold travel speed range, all at the same pressure. And that gives you a huge advantage. And uh, basically what it means is you're just going to choose a pressure that you like. You're going to choose a pressure that gives you the drift control or the coverage that you want for the nozzle that you have you're going to uh, choose that pressure and then travel at these different travel speeds. And that's your travel speed range. You're going to size your nozzle so that at your average target speed, you're going to be running at a 70% duty cycle. Okay, so that's key, 70% duty cycle. That gives you a little bit of room to move faster or for turn compensation, give you more flow. And it gives you quite a bit of room to, go to slow down without exceeding this travel speed range envelope at which the duty cycle is, you know, acceptable for the, um, uh, for the nozzle. Advantages, you know, turn compensation is a big one. Um, when we're going around sloughs, when we're going around corners, around, you know, shrubbery, bush, coolies, you name it. We are making turns with the inner side of the boom is underdosing, is overdosing, the outer side is underdosing. This is the problem area. Underdosing repeatedly around the same area of the field gives you 
a, a suboptimal dose, and that can lead to the slow development of herbicide resistance in those patches. So turn comp, huge advantage. We've got to be in the right duty cycle for the turn comp to work well. Another one is, of course, sectional control. We're going to save a ton of material by going from this very coarse, is about a 12-footer, to these individual nozzle sectional controls, about a 20-inch. Um, uh, the pulsing and the blending of the pulse, if you do it right, gives you uh, these overlapping um, basic patterns. So, you know, even though the nozzles are pulsing, there's never ever a part of the field that is actually unsprayed. Neighboring nozzles are out of sync with each other and they cover the ground that uh, uh, might be unsprayed by a temporary shutoff. So, this is a proper setup. You've got a 21 inch boom, you've got a 10 hertz system, that's the capstan system, the Raven system. You get running a 60% duty cycle, 15 miles per hour, you're doing 10 gallons per acre. This is a sweet spot, it works, okay? Now, if you go to a very coarse spray, if you go to a, 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 a fine spray, the duty cycle doesn't really matter because there's a lot of blending. But if we go, so, you know, we've gone to 100% duty cycle down to 25 and we're seeing really no difference in the variability. If we go with a very coarse spray and we use that at a very low duty cycle, the, the blending is less effective. And uh, there's a, a lot of time when both nozzles are actually off and we start getting this variability problem. So, um, Sizing your nozzles properly so you never reach this 25% duty cycle or very rarely do. And if you do, it's only at slow travel speeds is very key. Um, we'll finish off with these PWM myths and then go, go through a small sizing exercise at the very, very end. Remember that the cab, we, we started off this whole talk about pressure. The cab pressure is not your boom pressure. Okay, there's a lot of things that can happen between the you know, the, the pressure transducer, which is probably not far from the pump. It's probably at the center rack just before your sectional controls. And the, the valves, the elbows, um, the, you know, the T's and so on, all reduce pressure. And so does the solenoid. These solenoids at an 08 flow, a flow rate uh, can reduce pressure by over 10 PSI. So you actually have to measure the pressure at the boom. Easy to do, uh, uh, you know, a $20 gauge with some NPTs. You can buy a threaded cap, you can put it into your quick attach, put this on your boom, make sure you buy a good gauge, you trust it, spray with the whole boom and, uh, and take this pressure reading and then uh, compare it to your in-cab reading. Do it for high and low pressure, high and low duty cycles, that kind of a thing. And make sure that you know what your pressure drop is. Um, if you have a 10 PSI pressure drop, then you need to add 10 PSI to the cab pressure. If you want to run that nozzle at 50 PSI, you have to actually operate at 60 in the, in the, on the cab gauge. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the reason. Second myth, uh, you can use the same nozzle for all your water volume. You know, you got a five gallon tip, you got a 10 gallon tip usually, but here now you can just use duty cycle, use a 10 gallon tip only, choke it down to five gallons. Don't do that. The main reason we don't do that is you want to maintain that 60 to 80% duty cycle at your target travel speed. Okay, so high flow rate nozzles at low duty cycle result in reduced ability to slow down because you're already at a low duty cycle. You can't go any lower. You uh, are going to have a hard time changing the pressure because if you say increase the spray pressure at any given travel speed, you have to lower your duty cycle to compensate for that so that you won't have room to do that you'll have less blending of the pulse and your overall turn compensation won't be as good. So get a tip for your five gallons, get a tip for your 10 gallons. I've talked to guys that can, you know, do a, a seven and a 10 on the, out of the same tip. And we, we do a bit of compromising there, but here's what happens. Here's an 08. It's a five gallon tip, 15 miles per hour. That lowering of the gallonage has reduced the duty cycle from 30 from 60 that we had before to, to 30 and we've got these gaps and we've got the checkerboard and we don't want that, okay? Uh, if someone tells you that PWM reduces drift, they're not entirely wrong, but they're mostly wrong because drift is still a function of spray quality, function of boom height, function of travel speed, a function of wind speed. 
Um, all PWM gives you is consistency in pressure. So once you said, I need this amount of drift control, you're going to have that regardless of your travel speed, more or less. Uh, but, you know, without that step, uh, PWM doesn't give you any advantages. You could choose the wrong nozzle and get a lot of drift. Uh, you do have the opportunity to drive faster with PWM. My guy that I had the picture of, you know, he uh, he had extra capacity and his rate controller let him go 25. Um, so he did. Um, you're sizing your nozzles at about a 30 to 40% deficit so that you have that 70% duty cycle running. Um, but uh, so you could technically harvest that, go 100% duty cycle. But, you know, all I can really tell you is it's a bad practice. So let's try to not do that. And uh, lastly, um, with uh, PWM, uh, simply double the nozzle size. So this is uh, if, you're, if you're entering the PWM market and you've been using 05s, then people say, well, you should be using 10s. That's not entirely true. You, you, that might be true if you're moving from a, a higher pressure air induction tip to a lower pressure pre orifice style. So that's a typical situation for John Deere with exact apply. Customers were using the ULD at high pressures and they, then they moved to the LDX. It's much finer, so they had to go to lower pressures. They would have had to go to twice the size nozzle, but your actual situation should be your target flow should increase by 30 to 40. So look at that. And let's let's do this little exercise. That's the last thing we'll do. Um, here's a chart or three or four sizes. Here's your pressure. Here's your flow rates. Okay. We're doing 10 gallons. We want to do uh, our you know uh, 15 or so uh, uh, miles per hour. Here are the solutions. Um, remember, we're now targeting about uh, half a US gallon per minute on that nozzle. If we wanted to go to a, 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 a PWM uh, nozzle, then we would need to increase the flow of that nozzle by about 30 to 40%. A trick that we can use these charts for is to simply pretend that we are putting on more water. So we just simply say, all right, let's put on 14 gallons. You're putting on 10, but you're sizing for 14, okay? Tom, Tom we got a question here. Yeah. What is PM, PWM? PWM is pulse width modulation. I should have said that right at the beginning. Pulse width modulation is a way of uh, controlling the flow rate of a nozzle by intermittently pulsing a solenoid. And it is now present in about 30 to 40% of our sprayers. So it's actually becoming quite common. And I apologize for not, uh, for not having covered that. I, I made the assumption wrongly that everyone knew that. Uh, we will, in the next talk, in half an hour, uh, go into detail on PWM. And we'll, we'll uh, uh, maybe have a chance to explain a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, that's what it is. Thank you for the question. So um, pulse width modulation then would, we would simply go to um, that 14 gallons per acre. That's, that increases our flow rate. Now look at the solutions. The solutions are larger nozzles uh, at the same travel speed. And we've increased our flow rate from 0.5 US to 0.7 US. Okay, that's kind of what we've done. But we might have chosen this nozzle here. We might have gone from an 04 at 70 to an 08 at 30 because of the different kind of nozzle that it is. So these are the exercises that we, we do have to go through to property size for PWM. All right, what did I say today? I said, I, said, I guess the following seven things. Match your spray quality to the weed in other words, wettability of the weed, and to the active ingredient. In other words, is it a contact or a systemic? Is it a grassy killer or not? And your water volume. You've got to always look after the most limiting factor. If you've got a contact in the mix, or you have a grassy herbicide in the mix and grassy targets, you are going to be forced to spray a finer spray in order to get that efficacy. This, the tip sizing thing seems like a mundane exercise, but actually you'll learn a lot about whether you've got the right tip or not, whether you're using it at the right pressure and travel speed. Remember, use your uh, pressure gauge as your speedometer, okay? 
Uh, understand the spray quality that's out there. Uh, deposit uniformity is fundamental. Uh, the water sensitive paper is a good tool. Uh, we didn't talk about adjuvants, uh, but uh, you might want to, you know, run adjuvants that you're going to run as you do the droplet sizing with your water sensitive paper and make sure everything's still the way you think it is. And of course, uh, this whole pulse with modulation revolution is uh, definitely important. So with that, guys, I'm going to turn it back to you, James. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, hopefully we still... Uh, have our participants with us and we have some time. I'll leave it to you, James, uh, for questions. Oh, excellent work, Tom. And, you know, as a chemical rep, I get those questions all the time. Why didn't it work? And the information you provided sure is enlightening to some of that. Um, if there are any other questions um, while I'm finishing up some housekeeping, uh, we will get those answered by Tom, but he will be back for another engaging session in about another 20 minutes. Um, so again, Thank you guys for joining us. Um, we hope you found this session to be informative. Thanks to Tom and Corteva for sponsoring this session. The next session will begin at 10.30. It's gonna cover spraying technology preview for 2021. What's hot, what's not with Tom Wolf. Again, if you are not registered, please go to mtagbiz dot org and register ntagbiz.org and register i see one other question on the q a tony could you read that off my q a box isn't coming up question is can can he help me answer why or if airplanes at three to five gallons are just as effective as tin from a ground rig yeah that's a that's a great question marcus uh the um Airplanes really can't do the ten gallons that easily because their hopper isn't big enough, and they have logistical issues. They're you know they have a, lar a large ferrying distance, and so they're doing the five gallons because they have to. In fact, they're often doing less than five. Um, what they're doing is they're spraying a finer spray. I mean, that's really how they're doing it. And the penalty they pay is they are more sensitive to weather conditions and drift, and they have to stop spraying sooner. So that's really the, the reason. I mean, we can spray with less water if we are prepared to take a hit on the, on the window of opportunity. The whole low drift revolution, in my mind, is actually a productivity tool that gives us hours in the day to spray. Uh, if we have large distances to cover or large areas to cover, and, it, and of course, spraying is a very timely issue, then I view that extra window uh, to be very, very important. Aircraft have, have high productivity too, uh, because of course they're flying 140 miles an hour, but that's really the reason. Um, they are taking a bit of a hit on drift potential and have to choose their times better. Great question. Thank you for that. Excellent. Excellent. Nice explanation, Tom. Uh, I want to just maybe add something to it uh, because it, it prompted me. Um, timing trumps application method. What I mean is if you have to spray today to get the window, if the pest is there, the insect, particularly if the insect is there, uh, waiting a day or two um, is devastating, can be. If the weather, if there's a bad weather system coming in and you don't get your job done and the bad weather delays you by four or five days because of wet ground, that's devastating. Okay, you can lose a lot of yield that way. So I say focus on productivity, not application method per se. Um, get the acres done. The small hit you might take in terms of coverage and so on are probably minor compared to the timing effect. Hire the aircraft if they, you need the aircraft to get the job done. Just do it. It's better to be timely. And don't, don't worry about whether it's just as good. It'll, it'll be close enough. Excellent points. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Well, if there's no more questions, we're all going to take about a 10, 15 minute break here. And we're all going to be back for uh, Tom's next session with an additional sponsor. Thanks, everyone.